Hello. In this video, I'd like to give you the learning points from my tutorial series solving the time independent Schrodinger equation. Hopefully, this video will tell you whether or not you should be checking out the rest of the series. So, I've written the time independent Schrodinger equation in direct form here and in wave function form here. I've defined the Hamiltonian energy operator on the top right of your screen, which we can insert into the time independent Schrodinger equation to get the differential equation we must solve. Unfortunately, it looks a bit clunky, so we're going to apply the variable x and we're going to use primed notation for the zeroth derivative, first derivative, and second derivatives of psi. This allows us to rewrite the time independent Schrodinger equation in this form here, which I'm sure you'll agree is much neater. Note, of course, we don't have a first derivative term. Now, in order to solve this differential equation, I'm going to use the characteristic equation, which is something I've covered in a previous tutorial series. Basically, we must put the differential equation in the form given on the bottom right of your screen. The most important point here is that the coefficient on the second derivative must be equal to 1, and that's not what we have. In order to do that, I'm going to gather all of the constants, and there are basically two ways of doing this. We could define it as twice m outside of e minus v over h bar to be squared, or we could swap the order of e minus v, which will require us to take out the minus sign, and that's what I've done over here. Now, I'm going to call the first definition here as k sub 1, and I'm actually going to square it for mathematical convenience, because I'm going to take a square root later on. And I'm going to define this over here as k sub 2 to be squared. And I'm sure you're going to see that by defining the particular constants in this you know this fashion is going to make the time independent Schrodinger equation look slightly differently. However, I'm going to tell you that the solutions, though they will look different, will always have the same information contained within them. So, the differential equation we're looking to solve is given on the top center of your screen. In order to use the characteristic equation, we must put the differential equation in this form here. And we've done that by defining our coefficients or constants k sub 1 to be squared and k sub 2 to be squared. So now we have basically two different ways of writing the same equation. We have this form here or this form here. And the most important point to note is that we have a plus k sub 1 to be squared times psi or a minus k sub 2 to be squared times psi. And that will result in us having different looking solutions, both of course having the same information. Now, although I haven't written the characteristic equation, I'm telling you that the solution to it is lambda, and lambda is a complex number. Furthermore, the characteristic equation is a quadratic equation, so it's going to have solutions looking like this. And I'm going to tell you that the a, b, and c in this case are going to be the coefficients a, b, and c on our differential equation. Now, clearly, in the way we've defined the time independent Schrodinger equation, b is going to be 0 and c is either going to be plus k sub 1 to be squared or minus k sub 2 to be squared. Now because lambda is a complex number, it has a real component alpha and an imaginary component beta. And this now is all we need in order to write down the general solution to the time independent Schrodinger equation. And it is given in the bottom center of your screen. So we have e to the alpha x, where that's just a real exponential, outside of a linear combination of cosines and sines, where the argument of the cosines and sines is beta x, where beta is the imaginary part of your solution lambda to your characteristic equation. So, we get a differential equation, we write it in this form here, we solve the uh, characteristic equation for lambda, if it has a real component, we put it in to the, uh, to the exponent of our real exponential, and if there's an imaginary component, it goes into the argument of our trigonometric functions, cosine and sine. And that's it, really. But before we finish, let's actually look at the way we defined our differential equations because of k sub 1 and k sub 2 to be squared. So, in this case here, we have k sub 1 to be squared plus k sub 1 to be squared. And what that's going to result in is a negative number in the argument of the square root. And because b is 0, Basically, we're just going to get a purely imaginary solution to lambda. In other words, alpha is going to be 0. So e to the naught is 1, 
So the real exponential term will be zero, and we'll be left simply with a linear combination of cosines and sines. So the solution to this differential equation is going to be a cos b to x plus b sine b to x. Conversely, if we have c as minus k sub 2 to be squared, the argument here is going to be a real number. There will be no imaginary component to lambda. That means that the sine of a naught is naught, the cos of naught is 1, and we'll be left with a real exponential. So the solution to this differential equation is a linear combination of real exponentials. So, thanks for watching. I know that was a bit of a rapid fire round. Hopefully, at this point, I'll have convinced you that you should be checking out the rest of my tutorial series. And happy studies.